Well, I tell you, I managed Dele Sal in 2012 and we had a meeting at the start of the year and we were kind of saying, it wasn't systematic talk, we were saying, look, the forwards are going to have to track back, help yeah. out and all that stuff. And one hand went up, I won't tell you that. I won't tell <laughs> no, you that. No, no. <laughs> one hand went up. My job is to score, not, not to help out, my job is to score. Limerick v Tip, Wexford v the Cats. It's provincial final time, it is big time. Welcome to Corbett and McGrath's Big Build Up, brought to you by Centra. I'm Conan Doherty, this is Larry Corbett, this is Derek McGrath, two of the finest hurling minds in all of the country. Or should I say, three of the finest hurling minds, Derek? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, I suppose, look, sometimes you're trying to do your bit of analysis, if you like, and anything bar watch Love Island in the other room, if you like, so the, the little lad is... <laughs> Makes his way down to the room every now and again and has, has his opinion like he's entitled, I suppose. Let's get a look at what exactly we're talking about yeah, here. Yeah. Is this a video? Yeah. What's the speaker now, Mance? The sweeper. What's the sweeper now, Mance? Didn't you see enough of it in your, during your five years, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> so it's Owen, that's, that's your son? Yeah, yeah, five years of age, yeah. And he's already talking about the seventh defender? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's been, he's been brought up on a, on, a, on, a, on a diet of seven defenders, unfortunately. Whether it's good or bad, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Looking at the clip there, I wonder who's taking responsibility and watch for this seventh defender. Or else he's teaching him very young. That's t is that a bit too young, would you think, to be teaching him as a seventh defender? I don't young. Like, yeah, he's going to be a good manager anyway, I think. <laughs> it looks like with the bottle in the hand. Perfect. <laughs> Culture and negativity being, being dispersed early, early, early in his life. <laughs> you think a temporary be talking about a full forward there, just being a traditional 15 on 15. Yeah, well, we wouldn't be giving tactics that young there now. We'd let them maybe enjoy the under 8s, under 12s, maybe first before we go to serious tactics. Yeah, and then like under that. 14, you're on the sideline then taking notes. That's it, that's it, yeah, again, yeah. <laughs> All right, lads, so it's provincial final weekend. Um, we've got obviously Lancer and Munster Crowns to be divvied out. We've got Joe McDonough Cup as well. If you want to have a bit more of an insight into that, be sure to check out the GA or Willie's a good leash man, so he's going to give it all the love it deserves. But we have Munster and Leinster finals to look forward to. I just want to ask to start off with, is it different going into a final? Like, how do you prepare going into a final? Is it different to any other game? I think it is for, well, for, I can only personalise it in a Watford situation because we've been in so few, I suppose, in the last 100 years. Mm. It always brings an extra bit of fanfare around the town, a little bit of extra interest from terms of the media point of view and probably different from a managerial point of view, albeit you try and keep it as normal as possible, but you realise, given the, the mean history of, of, of Waterford, that you mightn't have huge opportunities to, to win them over the years, so you put all your focus on trying to pr produce the best performance you can. Would you find yourself doing anything different in, in the week building up to a final? I always um, would like to say that you have to keep the routine the same. So from whatever matches that you would have played all year, right down, this is a Munster final, so the routine should be the same. But what I found is that everything else changed around you. <coughs> so your phone got a little busier with Texas, Inside and work, you got maybe a little bit more popular that week. With that week, and maybe people want to ask you some different types of questions about the game. That was, was that annoying? It was different. So if something is if if, if something is, is 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 different, it's not the same routine. So people weren't that interested maybe in the league or maybe challenge matches we were playing all year. So it's about keeping things the same. But I think when the guys come together on the Tuesday and the Thursday, that's where you want to be in with the lads, doing the same things on the Tuesday if it's training again on the Thursday, the team being called out on Friday. So you want to keep things the same. But the one thing I did know is a lot of things changed and it's about how you deal with that. And Liam and the senior members of the, of the team, will, they'll know that. So the younger fellas that's there, they'll be looking up to how was the likes of Park Mayor deal with a Munster final weekend? How was Liam Sheedy deal with a Munster final weekend? They'll see that they're natural and they're normal and the younger players, they'll feed off that. Yeah, Derek, that's an interesting point because I wanted to ask you about management. Like, do you have to check yourself a bit during the week? Do you find that you're getting a bit excited as well? Yeah, you would. I think I'd be lying if I didn't say And a mixture of security and insecurity, looking ahead. I remember the night of the 2.15 or 16 Munster Finals against Tipperary, the night before the qualifiers are on. So you allow yourself even negative connotations of, I think Limerick were playing Dublin. We were saying to ourselves, Dublin, Dublin, Dublin beat Limerick. So if we lost the Munster final the next day, I have to be I have to be honest and completely selfish and say I did allow myself a moment to say, God, if we lose tomorrow, we've Dublin in the quarter final. So you wonder how focused I actually was ahead of some of those Munster finals, given the kind of the nature of the Munster final. If you like, so checking yourself, yeah, you would. We would have made a, a huge effort in terms of the emotional investment and trying to make sure that we could get one massive effort. 
and it didn't materialise. 2.15 we were beaten comprehensively by Tip and 2.16 we were hammered in Limerick by Tipperary. So you'd have to look at you in terms of your preparation. In retrospect now you'd be looking at how wrong you got it if you like but in the run up to the game you're, you're just making sure that everything is right for the best possible performance and you just have to deal with, with the aftermath as it happens. Are you, it probably changes depending on how the group is feeling and stuff, but do you try to sort of introduce a bit of crack or to keep it lighter? Like, does things change? Yeah, yeah, I think so. As the years went on, it certainly did. Even, like, simple thing in, in 2016, if you like, when we got to the all semi final against Kilkenny, the general perception would be that Waterford should travel up on the morning of, of the games, sleep in your own bed, etc. But the group we had, I felt the earlier they were together in the weekend, given the kind of mix, the dynamic of the group, the, the youth in the group, the better the focus was, you know. And even when I look back at Munster finals, albeit they were in Turles, I might have looked back and getting together on the Saturday, if you like. And Eamon Fitzmaurice made that point in, in the paper the weekend. I was just reading the point he made where when Kerry got together on the Saturday before the games, he always felt they had to be together on the Saturday. That that was the kind of the you know the, the best the best kind of way of them performing in, in in a given day. So yeah, I think that that was very much encouraged, particularly given the the, the age profile of the team where you had your messers, you had the fellas that liked the crack and they were able to hone in then on a performance when it came to the match and that has to be encouraged because if you're all the time completely serious about your approach from the Friday night you finish, you're into the Saturday, you're travelling up together or the Sunday and there's no sense of enjoyment about it, sure, none of us will be at it otherwise. Yeah. You know? And what about superstitions, Lar? Did, did you have any? You strike me as somebody who might have had a few routines in the changing room before a game. Um, not, r not really, no. Um, and... Just to go back on your point, even about just travelling up, I didn't have any control of if there was a question asked and lads wanted to or some lads might want to travel up the night before or some lads wanted to go up um, that morning. I knew I didn't have full control over, so I said, I'd, I'd be big into, I'm not letting my mind now um, have an opinion on that. So if I'm asked to go up that morning, I'll go up that morning. If I'm asked to go up that evening, I'll go up that evening. It didn't make a difference. I knew I had no control over it. And, I didn't want to invest any part of my thought process because I knew that if I preferred something and then it didn't happen, I said, oh, that's a, that's a disappointment. Um, as regards going into the dressing room and some guys might want to um, wear the same socks or the same jocks or whatever, that, <laughs> I never wanted to get involved in that because I said, if I forgot them or left them at home and if something came in that I was kind of doing on a regular basis, I make my business to change it. I never wanted to have it that I had something as regards superstition and then if it didn't work out, I, I, I think it used to play, it would play tricks with my mind. I wouldn't be able to handle that part of it, I, I think. Yeah, so your superstition was not having a superstition? Not, <laughs> not, not having one. Now, yeah. that's, that's it. And I was very conscious of that because I'd hate to have it in my mind yeah. that um, I, had, I was thinking about something before a game that is, was irrelevant to the game. And just finally on this, lads, like, Derek, I think from a manager's point of view, do you try to sort of make your pre-game speech the one? Or again, is it about not hyping boys up too much? Yeah, a balance again. Friday night, we'd say when, when the team would be given out on the Friday night, Dan would have normally spoken for us and, and I would have just given the team. It would have been really kind of emotive. We would, the days we met in Turles, we'd meet in the horse and jockey. We'd go through our tactical approach before we leave for, for the field. And then you'd have about four or five minutes where you crank it up emotionally, you know, yeah. remind them who they're representing, remind yeah. them why we do it, and remind them of the freedom that goes with real, the realisation that everybody here is in it together and for the right reasons, you know, I think that brings a certain sense of freedom. In the dressing room, there'll be completely simple messages, you know, all messages around the hooks, blocks, tackles, all messages about working yeah. together, helping each other out, yeah. and a sense of freedom in, 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 in the approach when you're hitting the field, so it wouldn't be hugely emotional, it'd be a bit of emotive for, for three or four minutes, I suppose, inside in the horse and jockey before you go, and then maximum probably a minute of a, of a spiel if you like before you hit the field yeah and is that punching changing or punching yeah, lockers no, no no it'd be a, bit, a little bit limbering up in the dressing room you know I was, I was big on, on, on just you know jogging on the spot in the dressing room and that kind of stuff you know some fellas like to kind of give it a 1 to 10 you know shouting yeah, 1 to yeah. 10 and all that kind of stuff. a lot of fellas very, some, some guys in the dressing room really really quite they have their own profile do their own thing you know, other guys just just performing a bit of mobilisation and and getting their their, their pre kind of activation done, if you like, interesting. But I would have liked to kind of just pump it up just before we went out, if you like, just remind them why we're doing it. Because in the modern day now, you're out 27, 28 minutes before the actual throwing, and on the big days and days of an other and final, you're out probably you know 35 yeah. minutes beforehand. So it's very important to get that kind of mood 
right in advance of the game so that you can you can be up for it as as the ball is thrown in as opposed to anything else. So just I think all those things are I won't say they're overthought, but they're if you do something really really well on a given day, you're inclined to kind of follow that particular routine the next day. But you have to allow for kind of a variance uh, yeah. approach as well. That's Aidan Nolan mm-hmm. is suspended for Wexford now. He got two game suspension um, after an altercation with the referee after the game uh, against Kilkenny. Yeah. It, like, that must be so annoying like for him to realise now if they win this provincial final he's not back until the all Ireland final Yeah, I think it was um, a rush of blood to the head yeah. um, I think the Wexford players thought to themselves maybe that they were out of the championship you could see when the final whistle went that Davey didn't know were they in were they out everything was um, disbelief so did he think that there was another 30 seconds that should have been played did he get onto <laughs> Fergal Horgan and say well you blew it up early and I say he expressed his, his emotion there and then if he knows, if he knew, just say, if he knew, I'll have to, sorry. Go no, ahead, like, okay. if, if, go ahead, like, if, if he knew <coughs> that the game, that they were already... I think, what he, I think what he knows now, if yeah. he knew that then, yeah. he wouldn't be expressing his emotion. Yeah, because he would have been celebrating. Yeah, exa- exactly. So I just think he got caught, and it's a huge, huge lesson to learn. It must be a tough one as a manager, though, because right? that's probably something that you don't want to lose a player for something after a game. Yeah, and look, trying to look into the future, you'd imagine there'll be some appeal process trying to get it reduced yeah. to one game. I'm just thinking, you know, we're, we're, we're speculating in terms of, we're, we're presuming that it was, you know, abuse of an official, or we're presuming that it was back chat. And, you know, it, it raises more of a probably pertinent question around the refereeing of that night, Fergal Horgan's decision making yeah. in terms of, you know, he obviously recognised the kind of, the volatile kind of atmosphere that it was, and he went along with that in terms of his approach, which I welcomed on the night. You know, yeah, but it's yeah. just the consistency, I suppose, in terms of the match that we look ahead to in a while there. In terms of the two matches at the weekend, will they be refereed in a similar manner when you're away from Innovate Park in Wexford, when you're in Croke Park, or when you're in the Gaelic Grounds? Will they be will they be refereed in, in in a similar manner by the other referees? But it's for me, there's, there'll be an appeals process that that I, I'd imagine will be followed because it, it seems a very harsh. Um, scenario for a guy to possibly win a Leinster final and not be involved till the yeah. final given the impact that Aidan Nolan has had on yeah. Wexford in the last two years especially and just on the referees there as well I think that the referees had to sit down and, and speak after the last few matches over the last few weeks so what approach are they going to take are they going to take the approach of Tip and Limerick in Torles two weeks ago that standard refereeing or are they going to take the approach of Kilkenny and Wexford in Wexford Park two weeks ago yeah um, they're completely different games mm. and how they're riffed. So then players going to Crow Park Sunday to get into their cars, to get into their buses and they're going, they don't know what way this thing is going to be riffed. So they're going to have to wait for the first five minutes to find out, right, so um, certain type of referee is letting it go. Or actually, so hey, we can hurl away here today. Yeah. Or is it going to be that whole minute now we have to be conservative here and they're going to be um, blown for everything. So someone has to make a decision here and say, what is the standard? Yeah. What's a free and what's not a free? You wonder are you heading into a situation, the rugby scenario, where earlier in the week you're briefed from the referee, yeah. manager, captain, yes. you know, a scenario where, listen, this is what we're going to be looking at, this one, you know, without, you know, going crossing the boundaries all the time, but, you know, there's a lot to be said for clear information as to what referees are looking for in terms of, you know, what is the foul, what isn't the foul. You know, the earlier season kind of indications that the hand pass would be looked at or that the head high tackle would be looked at. Mm. Yes. And the reality is, as, a, as an ex-manager, I suppose, you're looking from the outside. You, you want the intensity of Wexford Park. If you're really, you know, as a spectator, I yeah. suppose, you're kind of saying you want the intensity of it. But yet, if you're, if you're crying out for a freeze and you're reliant on freeze, you're kind of saying to yourself, the consistency has to be kind of across the board with their approach. And just when the game starts then, and just say there is a free, and just say a player has a question to the referee on that decision, referees are very, very quick. When the very minute they hear the, the English language, <laughs> up 10 yards. They're not even listening to the, they're not listening yeah, to the question. Yeah, yeah. So this is a communication thing as well. It's between the referee and the player. Sometimes if you come to a referee, you can ask a question in a normal manner of just say a question that you have. Yeah. For the benefit of your team, you can go back to your, your, to your teammates and you can say, well, now this is a situation. So it's about communication, not straight away 10 yards. Yeah, assuming because, that you're being cantankerous. A, exactly, because all, all that does is get the levels of aggression up on each player. So the referee and the sorry the audience will end up losing here as regards to quality of the game. Yeah, and instead of putting the complete blame on it as well, I think the interaction with the linesmen and umpires just needs to be on a different level. And I, many times over the five years, I was on the line and the linesman had turned to me and say, "I can't give it, I can't give it, I can't overrule it." You know, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And I said, "Did you not see that? I can't give it, I can't overrule it." Whereas, I, you know, that kind of team element or the collaborative yes. element yeah. is kind of. I think they're getting better at it now. I saw a decision at the weekend in whether the football or the hurling where the umpire. 
the umpire was clearly wired into it. The linesman, the linesman gave the decision, and it was a decision. The linesman obviously have a better view on on the point scoring in, in one of the football yeah. matches. You know, it's just I think they're getting better at it. You're rather than hanging the referee. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, like so, let's look at Wexford v Kilkenny. So it's at uh, four p.m. in Crow Park. Derek, you tipped Wexford to beat Kilkenny last week or two weeks ago when we were back on the show. Are they the standout performers of the championship so far? I think we've all been guilty of probably ignoring them, you know, yeah. to a certain degree. Um, you know, the progress they've made over, over, over the last number of years has been remarkable. I think there's a, the general perception is that Davy will come in and he'll have an impact with the team. And that impact won't be sustainable. Yeah. You know, that, that there's a fall-off period. Well, there's been no fall-off, you know. And I often say to myself, even when, when you're looking at the other managers involved at the weekend, Sheedy, Coily, Cody, what would either of the three of them do if they were manager of Wexford? You know, if Cody was manager of Wexford, if Sheedy was manager of Wexford, if Coily was manager of Wexford, how would they approach? So I think sometimes Davy can be beaten with a stick of, of, you know, not negativity, but, you know, I think he's have to be very in innovative with his team. And I think he, he's done that. And he has some very good players at his disposal as well, which is, you know, which is, you know, Wexford won 321 titles in a row only a number of years ago. So they have a good, a good core group of players as well that have performed really well throughout the league and have been stick like there's an argument to be made that they should have beaten Galway, a, a strong argument that they should have beaten Galway. Um, there's an argument to be made that they should have beaten Kilkenny the last day. Mm -hmm. They beat Carlow and, and um, they drew with Dublin and they only conceded a last minute penalty or twenty one to Dublin. So there's an argument to be made that they're you know, they're, they're basically they could be on full points heading into the Leinster final and then everyone would be talking to in a in a different light if you like. Yeah. So but they're serious outfit and seriously well organised. Well, they're up against the Cats and we're gonna look at how Kilkenny could sort of hurt Wexford from anywhere on the pitch and you've picked out a clip of Porrick Walsh. Yeah. Well I think the key thing here is two things. If you look at Conor McDonald's isolation, but it's also Kilkenny realising that because of the spare man they're able to give and go. So Porrick Welch goes, give and go and their team are flowing as one. You have Enda Morrissey in front of you, Hugh Lawler are all willing to go. And look, we were talking off air before we started about Porrick Welch's impact on the championship and just what he gives Kilkenny. Go back to the game against Dublin I think he was midfield, he started the, double, uh, the first half against Dublin, now I refer to it the last day. Kilkenny weren't going well against Dublin. They put Porrick Welch centre-back and the whole thing just took off from there. So his leadership ability, and I think you saw in, in the match against Kilkenny and Wexford, Joey Holden got, got, got forward, Paul Murphy got forward, each got a point. Because they know they have the licence to go with Porrick Welch back, they're able to go and they're able to talk, attack from different angles. But well, Kilkenny don't do tactics, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They take the game as it yeah, comes. Yeah, take it as it comes. Yeah. Well, Laura, like Wexford are an interesting one because they've tended to just play two forwards sometimes inside yeah. the opposition 45. As a forward, like what do you need to do there? So just say if there's two inside and we'll just say there's four Kilkenny backs. Yeah. Just say, for instance, there's three and just say there's a sweeper or just say there's another guy covering. I would always try and say to the two players, get in as close together as the, to the four Kilkenny backs. Because the further you're away, the further you spread out, it's two on one. I would like there that the two Wexford guys stand together inside in the full forward position. Stand together. Let all the Kilkenny lads come in on top of you. You have a better chance. The closer the Kilkenny backs are together, a better chance you have of getting the ball. And the simple fact is, if the Kilkenny guys are spread out and you're spread out, it's too easy. It's two on one yeah. on a regular basis. Get in around us. Play a two on full forward line. That is the only way. If you're giving the ball out to the corners, you have to beat your man, you have to beat the spare man, and you could have a third man on you. Get in where the danger is and get the ball in. Because you never know, inside in Crow Park, that ball will bounce. And if that ball bounces, you have to be just say, on it quick. If you're in the corners and it's three on one or it's, it's, it's one on two, there's not much of a chance. And are you going to shoot straight away when you get it? You're probably not going to try and take... It's going, take to, it's, 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 it's going to be hard. But you're looking for support. Like, the... The Wexford lads are going to be looking for support. Inside in your own, if you're being isolated, it's a very, very tough place. And it's a daunting place to be inside in Crow Park. Because if the ball is coming in and it's going out quick and there's a sweeper and if, if, if um, the Kilkenny guys are sweeping up easy ball and just if it's easy ball and they're giving a hand pack back to the goalie and there's an overlap coming, it's demoralising for the forwards that are inside. You need support and you need help and you have to follow it in. Yeah, well, Kevin Foley obviously has such an important position for them. And again, Derek, I think you've picked out sort of a uh, clip that shows how important he is at a Wexford setup. Yeah, and again, you see Killian Buckley, Buckley just picks a, uh, hits a random ball there. Damien Reck wins possession here with Billy Ryan down over. But you see Foley come into your picture and go away. He goes forward. So he's not on the edge of the D. They have the wind. He's a realisation that I have a handy score here. He also had a player out on his right-hand side that he could actually play to. And 
that's the ability where people, that's the offensive aspect of having a sweeper, where you have a guy cute enough to be able to say, I'll go now as we're winning position. You know, I'll go as we're winning position. I can offer an offensive trip by turning up in an unpredictable area, if you like. Yeah. And Wexford had a couple of goal chances in, in, in the first half in Wexford Park the last day. Liam McGovern played one to D. O'Keefe. They had another overlap there to Rory O'Connor where that's the way they're going to get the goals if they're playing with the, the four or five forwards. They'll get it by running at Kilkenny. But there's also the option for, for Davy perhaps to change it up as well. Yeah, well, let's pull up the tactics board and see exactly how you will change it up. OK, so this, I suppose, is what Wexford have set up with normally for, for most of the year. Kevin Foley back here as a seventh defender or sweeper. And the last day you would have had Matthew O'Hanlon taking up TJ Reid, Paulie Foley taking up Walter Walsh, and you would have Sean Murphy on Richie Lahey, if you said. So I'm just thinking that there may be a possibility that Wexford will, will change it up. And the reason I'm saying it is because if you look at the 2013 All-Ireland Final, um, Clare against, against Cork, you know, the general perception before the start of the game was that uh, Wexford, uh, Clare had played with a seven defender both again, in the quarter final against Galway and the semi final against, um, against Limerick, and everyone was expecting them. I'm just wondering will Davy roll the dice? Now, the, again, the general perception in that game was that they came out and they played 15 on 15, but what Davy actually did, and he might consider doing it at the weekend, is, is he will say Kevin Foley comes to the middle of the field and one of the boys come to the full forward line. So, what he did in that game is, is if you think back to the game, the Clare. Um, Cork game, he had a full forward in the first game, he had Darrell Conan, in the second game he had Shane O'Donnell. So he had Podge here and he had Conor McGrath and they had licence to go 45 yards from the goal. And because they were man-marked, he realised he realised that the space would be open, which would then allow his half forward line of Conor Ryan, uh, Tony Kelly and John Conlon. And again, because Tony Kelly was being man-marked, he was able to go everywhere, which opened up a one-on-one -on -one situation, the famous goal where Pat Donlan handed it to Shane O'Donnell. For, for the goal in the replay. So I'm just wondering, will Davey consider, because of the fact that Matthew Hanlon did so well on TJ the last day, because of the fact that Paddy Foley did so well on, on Walter Walsh, will he back his men to kind of basically say, you have the protection of the half forward line, you'll have the two corner forwards out wide and deep, which will leave a wall of five across the half forward line, and will he say for the first 20 minutes, I'm going to try and isolate maybe a Rory O'Connor, and the way he might be able to do this is, if he puts chin to centre forward, he might be a fella that Paulie Welch has to go with. You know, Paulie Welch mightn't be able to sit back if Chin is, is centre forward. If Chin, like something that Lar went on Brian Hogan in one of the All-Irelands, 2-11 I think, or 2-10, and he's, he's going all over the field, and next minute he appears inside in the full forward line. So it might be a chance, I just have a, a feeling that if, if there's a day where Davy will roll the dice, it might be this Sunday. You know, and it's, it's, it's just something that I was put, trying to put myself on Davy's head. And he'll be conscious at the same time of the space that Colin Fenley will have against Liam Ryan. That's probably his worry as a manager. He's saying, God, what if Fenley, what if Fenley gets three quick balls in on Liam Ryan and he turns him? But he also should, you know, be aware of the fact that Kevin Foley can filter back from middle of the field. He has the players to hurt Kilkenny, the Kilkenny back lane. And that's, that's the argument I would have. If you have Rory O'Connor, Lee Chin, Lee Moog McGovern, Paul Morris possibly coming out in this corner, Paul Morris, um, uh, possibly David Dunn, in the absence of, 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 of if Carl Dunbar is not picked, he has a pace to open up a team. And I'm just wondering, is he considering it? And it's just, look, it's speculation at this stage, but I'm just, as I said, you're just trying to put your head on, on Davies' head, which is, which is hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know? Laura, how, how important is that to try something new for a final? Because like, these teams obviously know each other well. They played each other two weeks ago. Yeah. Is it important to bring something different? Well, um, I'm going to try and explain what TJ is kind of going to do different this week than he done two weeks ago. So I just think that TJ then wants space. Where he's going to get space, he's going to get space around Kevin Foley because Kevin Foley won't want to watch him. Kevin Foley is about getting forward and helping the forwards. TJ's job around here this area is to cut out the space. And more often than not, when there's two players looking at one player, each player, some part of the job thinks, oh, Kevin has him, oh no, Matthew has him. And sometimes they could fall down between two stools. But when a player has you on his own, man marking job, it's very, very hard to get away from him because he's fully focused on you. To confuse the situation, as I said already, come back in here and try and find out exactly. Now, TJ has to come with a different plan than he came with the last day. He didn't score from play. 
he got on a few possessions, but he would have been disappointed himself that he didn't get on a, a more plays. So we know he is by far, well, I won't say, but he's one of the best hurlers that has ever played the game, but he's a thinking job now for the last two weeks. So he's to think his way. He will have it to do an awful lot of visualization before he even comes to the field. He knows where the goals are. He knows where, just say, the posts are. He knows all that. It's about how can he outfox the Wexford players. And my prediction is, if TJ scores three points or less Sunday, Wexford will be Leinster final champions. He's put his neck on the line there, Derek. Um, so this, uh, this is why you think, like you've called it, you've said Matthew Hanlon versus TJ Reid is the key matchup for this battle. There's going to be a few, but you think that is going to be the winner yeah, of the season? Yeah, and, and look, to be completely, not to be a hypocrite, before the actual Leinster final, I thought it would be Matthew Hanlon and Walter Walsh based on, on last year and based on Breen's... And James Breen had done a very good job on TJ Reid two years ago. So Matthew Hanlon had done, has done, did a brilliant job the last. That will be the key matchup. Again, not to repeat what Lara said, I remember, you said, the 2016 All-Ireland semi-final replay. Um, the general perception is in, the, in the draw match was that we had outworked Kilkenny, Waterford had outworked Kilkenny. So, and that the middle third was so, we'll say, the forward line was, we had the back line so congested and so kind of um, tight together that defensive unit was so tight together that there was no room for TJ. And I got a text to remember on a Friday night from a source in Kilkenny, shall we say, <laughs> that TJ Reid and Richie Hogan would play in the middle of the field and that Michael Finley would lie in on Tyg de Burke at centre-back, we'd say. This, this was going to be their approach, you know. And it, it actually it permeated its way to the field. It made its way to a field. So sometimes Lara could be right there in terms of sometimes you may need your best players further away from where they actually may the perception is where they will do the damage. And that, that's what could happen with, with, with TJ. And again, another little signpost on this is in the Leinster final of two years ago, Matthew Hannan picked up Joe Canning. He scored two points in the first half, Matthew Hannan, from play in the Leinster final first half because Joe had gone so deep yeah. that Matthew was able to nip a couple of points. He was able to hurl as well as just mark him. You know, he was able to just get on a couple of balls and nip a couple of points. But in the second half, Joe went even deeper. And mm. then it opened up for the rest of the forwards. So what we didn't see the last time is we didn't, with TJ coming as deep, perhaps in Croke Park, it might be more, you know, uh, it, it allows for him to come deeper, to open up a bit more space for the other forwards. He may even come deeper. He may stand out in the wing at times. He may come out of the play just to, to open it up for the other forwards as well. But it's intriguing, you know, because um, O'Hanlon did some job on him the last day. He was just so completely you know, razor like focus on, on, on keeping him at bay. Mm. He was manhandling him, you know, and in in a, in, a, in a very legitimate way. He was just completely up for it in terms of his approach to it and he knew that he knew what his singular job was, which is a great a great trait in any player. Yeah. That's great stuff, lads. We'll move on. You'll be delighted to hear to the Monster final. So we're going <laughs> down to Gaelic Grounds, two PM Sunday. It's Limerick V Tipperary. Is it a bit bonkers to think that Limerick could lose three games and find themselves in an all Ireland quarter final. Like what well, this is obviously the new, yeah, new format that we have. Yeah, this is the new format and I suppose at the minute <clears throat> it, it sounds it sounds bonkers, but the GA knew what they were doing. Like the like the possibilities of this happen year in year in, year out is very high. This is the second year of the three year format, they, they probably will keep it. Derek, do you like it? Yeah, I do. And from a Waterford point of view, I can't, be, I can't say we like it in terms of results, myself included, last year and this year. But yeah, I do. I like it. I think they've learned each year. I think last year the, the great debate was around no break between the games. I think they've done that. I think they've. I think there's a possibility of learning each year. You know, the possibility even even the losing finalists in in the provincial finals. I think they should have a home. You know, a home quarter final if you like. You know, it's something like that could happen for the reward for being in the top two. You know, in terms of Munster final or Leinster final, I think that, that's something that could come on board. Um, the whole scoring average debate, you know, you know, you look at Michal O'Donoghue, you look at, you know, the Clare boys going out on, on you know, going out, going out and having four points and the other guys having four points, you know, winning two, losing two. I think, you know, how you fix it, a solution base, I'd have to put my head on it for the winter in terms of our, you know, in terms of coming up with a solution rather than just being the, the humdrum, cliched, you know, they should do something about it. I'd rather be able to come up with some sort of solution, you know, in my own head. Um, yeah, I like it. It's 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 fiercely enjoyable. It's the longevity of it in the you know in terms of the long term. Not that I'd worry about, it, but just be careful about it. That people will, you know, last year for instance we were in a dead rubber game against Cork, um, the last round of the championship. This year we were in a dead rubber game against Cork, the last round of the championship. You just need to be careful around around not the marketing of it. If if it's if it's if it's a viable kind of product, come the end of the championship, it's it's better. The whole idea of a team losing three times. 
and winning the championship. I think it's probably just it's it's paper talk. It's it's it, it's 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 John Coyley. If he does lose a third time, it'll be and he comes back and he wins it in the in the in the back door. Shall we say he'll be after just learning more than everyone else through the defeats, mm. and he'll be the benef- you know the beneficiary of of those defeats. Yeah, well, interestingly, there was defeats. I remember in episode one we spoke about Limerick against Cork and how it's tough now for Limerick as all Ireland champions to come in under the radar. But somehow they're under the radar. Yeah, <clears throat> and I suppose why they're after coming in under the radar is, I suppose, the last, just say, two Cork and then the last two um, tip the last day. They are coming in under the radar. Now they're, in, they're after landing themselves in a Munster final. And I think that what Derek is after saying there, the two losses, he's after learning a lot about his players and he's after changing it up a bit from the last day. Yeah, like, can... Can Tipperary sustain this though? Like, can they keep that going as much as say Limerick might find themselves floating a bit under the radar? Well, I think they want. To, you know, I think they're in a little bit of a different situation than they were ahead of two weeks ago. In that, you know, the perception has has well, obviously the injury situation in terms of Kyle Barron and Bonner Mar has changed things to 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 a, to a, to a certain degree, um, and there's there's the feeling, maybe in my in my bones, if you like that, can you sustain it all the way? I think I think. The answer is yes, you can. Will they is a different is a diff, there's a different answer to that question in terms of will they? And if they were to have a knock, you know, in my own head, I'm saying if they if they lose the Munster final, there's Dublin in a quarter final, there's potentially Kilkenny or Wexford in a, in a, in a semi final, mm. and I'm saying will Tip and Limerick will be will this is the second part of a trilogy? I can't get my head mm. around the fact that that's what I foresee in my own head. I'm kind of you know, so I'm I'm always kind of jumping forward in terms of a. A managerial perspective on things in terms of where things might go or what, where things I'd imagine Sheedy is just concentrating on ensuring that that work ethic and that honesty of approach and the obvious hurling skills are just married to produce another performance ahead of you know that there's not this kind of the thing has turned for us Limerick have the advantage they're at home they're under the radar <coughs> tip just consistently performing working on the simplicity of their approach in terms of hooks, blocks, tackles, everything like that. And can they sustain it? They can sustain it. Will they? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and as, like another thing then is that like John Kiley is further down the road as regards putting a panel and um, a tried and tested panel together than Lean. Like looking at it from a Tipperary tipper point of view, like we're delighted in Tip of where Tipper after turn around in, this, in a short space of months. We didn't think that this was going to happen, happen this quick. But Liam hasn't got a chance to get his panel together, maybe like he would have liked to put it together, where just John Kiley is two years maybe down the road, more so than Liam. But we do know that it's coming, and bit by bit it's coming, that the panel is coming together. I think that's what they call a cute temporary man, just trying to play it down. (laughs) (laughs) Well, how big a loss is Bonner Maher? Derek obviously made him, but he's out. Yeah, um, Bonner Maher is a huge, huge loss. Um, In temporary, when... After big games, the amount of people would say the hook that Bonner got was a game changer. The, the, he's always involved in big plays. Let it be, uh, Derek, you were saying earlier on, even running through the middle, setting up a goal opportunity. Mm. There's, there's things that he mightn't be the best scorer in the world, but he's always involved in big plays in games that are game changers. He's definitely the most consistent person for work rate in Tipperary that I've ever played with and that I've ever really seen. He doesn't mind going into a tackle if it's three on one. He he actually sometimes could come out with the ball. He he is he lifts he lifts and lifts the team. But I think he'll be a major part of maybe the backroom team, maybe the dressing room. I wouldn't be surprised if he says something in that dressing room in Limerick before them guys go out because Bonner Maher is the backbone of that team over the last number of years. He's respected and when he talks, people will listen. And I think that could be a nugget that could be used on Sunday. Yeah, and I think he's reinvigorated as well under Liam, you know, and and Eamon and and the boys. I think he's the, he, and what he is as well, he's quick. You know, a mm. lot of the, a lot of the criticism put Tipperary's way before the championship started was a, a perceived lack of pace. If you like, I said it myself. I, t- I felt the backline perhaps were, you know, they could be opened up with, with legs. If you like, you know, and and he, he, even in the forward line, you have John McGrath, you have Bubbles, you have you have Shamie Callan. I don't think. I don't think they burn you, like you know, in terms of you know a Dara Fitzgibbon or and Conor Lahan or you know in terms of fellas that are rockets, if you like, uh, Garrod Hegarty, you know, long, long, long strided kind of you know approach, and I think Bonner gives you a lot of pace. I think that's under underrated outside um, the Tipperary dressing room is that he's he's quick, like he's very very quick and deceptively quick in actual fact. 
Yeah, so we're, we're the rest of them are obviously quality hurlers. He just has something a bit different. Yeah, and the rest of them are not slow. It's not that I'm saying they're slow, but he, yeah. he's kind of, he's different. He's direct. Look at the goal he got against Clare. Like, his touch it was better than has, been, has is better than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, his hurt, what was, there's the perfect fusion of a fella who's a warrior and, and also there's also, the, and Lara would know more about this, there seems to be a bit of presence about him, you know. There seems to be a connection between himself and the Tipperary yeah. people as well in terms of, you yes. know, just, just the, you know, for a long time, I won't say Tipperary were, 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 were snobs in terms of their, 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 their <laughs> approach. You, know, you can say it. No, yeah. but like, like, I think there's, there's been a general appreciation between the ordinariness of Bonner, and I mean that with the greatest respect for him, yeah. in terms of how he approaches it. Don't know the chap, but seems to be a very humble chap, hard-working, down-to-earth kind of, you know, setting the tone for everybody else and, you know, a real leader. And you can't underestimate yeah. the value of a leader to a squad and an on-field leader, yeah. you know, and I think that's, that's what he is. Yeah, that's a huge point and um, that's, a, that's Bonner in a nutshell, what Derek is saying. Sometimes, myself included, we thought our job was to put the ball over the bar and put the handy one into the net when we got it, but sometimes we found it maybe a little hard to put in the work rate, put in the hard yards. When Bonner came, he had that. I don't know where he got it from because he wasn't shown within the Tipperary dressing room because that wasn't a thing that we maybe were good at or maybe to do it at a high intensity. But he came with that and then there was a connection between Bonner and the Tipperary public that saw that because it was so, so different. So when he got in this huge block or he got in this huge tackle, it sent shockwaves through just say the team itself, but you could hear the crowd then coming with us. Yeah. You used to buy into it. Mm. And then sometimes them situations are worth two points in a game not on the scoreboard, for the value it is to the team on that day. You boys are making me think of, you know, those classic divides you get in a changing room where the defenders are blaming the forwards and the forwards are blaming the defenders. And you said about how you thought your job was to put it over the bar. Yeah. Would that happen if they hit the county level? Well, I tell you, I managed De La Salle in 2012 and we had a meeting at the start of the year and we were kind of saying, it wasn't systematic, though. we were saying, look, the forwards are going to have to track back, help yeah. out and all that stuff. And one hand went up. I won't tell you that. <laughs> I go on, tell no, us. No. <laughs> One hand went up. My job is to score, not not to help out. My job is to score. I might, you know. Yeah. But I think the mentality has changed. Yes. I think I think the mentality has changed, and that and it, in my opinion, none of the teams are actually playing too too differently from each other, despite all the talk and I know more than myself talking about systems or tactical structures. In that the forwards, the half forwards' job in particular is to they're double jobbing. They're hooking, they're blocking, yeah. they're chasing. They're the first chaser if a yeah. wing forward, if a wing forward on the other side rounds a wing back, and they're expected to get back up the field to offer an offensive threat to help out their full forward line as well. So for me, there's no real change in, in the approach in terms of the last couple of years. But go back to 212, I suppose. I think even even in 212 at club club level, it was uh, you know the old fashioned situation where. I talked to my young lad last week and he was in the corner for Dallas Allen and he came home and he said, I didn't get much ball, you know. And I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's leaning on the hurling and he's saying, I didn't get much ball, no ball was hit into me. Where nowadays you kind of just got to go looking for work, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the mantra now is I think you, you look for work and you know you're looking for a hook and a block and Jamie Cannon and them are bringing it from the full forward line out with Tipperary at the moment and every full forward line argue, are, are bringing that as well, yeah. you know. You should have said, don't worry, son, I've got a position for yeah. you. It's called the seventh defender. Ah, you'll geez. get all the loser balls out No there. warrant for that now. Feeling it'll be grand. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, what Tipperary do you have with or about Bonner Maher is, is movement. And Derek, you've picked out a, a great clip here. It's, it's from the last game, Tipperary v Limerick. And it's a Jason Ford point that we'll have a look at here. Yeah, look, I think the key thing there is, first of all, look where Peter Casey is and Sean O'Brien's. And look at Callan, like He just a quick look over his shoulder, a little reverse ball. And we were talking off here, Larry would probably be in a, even a better position to talk about this, in that Tipperary only need a small pocket of space. Look here, look at, look at forward with the hand up to the right. Another fella hit it into a kind of a, a zone of Limerick defence, but they're able to pick the pass out, even within 15 yards of space. And Larry won't remember this now, but when, when, when Larry was... When they were under Declan Ryan and Tommy, Ryan, Tommy Dunn's tutelage, I went up and I sat in, this, in the stand of Turles in 2000, I can't remember what the year it was, and it was year it was, and you were allowed, to, back in the time when you were allowed to sit in the stand, and I watched Tipperary play a little six aside in a really confined, confined space under Tommy Dunn, and they were heading to Fota, or they were heading on a training camp the next day, so they weren't doing a huge amount, and I remember sitting in the stand watching that kind of, that ability, just pick a pass in a, in a, in a just in a little kind of confined area of space and score, and tip, Lauer made the point that tip will kill you in a, in, in a, in a shootout, even outside you with small pockets of space, you know, the interesting thing for me, though, in that point of view was Sean O'Brien was with Peter Casey 110 yards from the goal. Yeah. He was with him, and he got the initial block. You know, so that meant that Paul Rigmar was back protecting the D. Yeah. You know? like, Lord, like, again, I keep asking you as a forward, but how important 
is that sort of movement and the different movement coming deep going in like you'll see sometimes drills the like corner forwards just run straight out because that's where the space yeah. is and they're being marked but you have to be a bit more clever don't you well i think what tip are doing this year is a bit more clever what got limerick um good good scores last year was their half back line midfielders passing the ball around to each other creating space now it might be only a hand pass five six yards but they were creating space and that then was given just say, a chance for Aaron Galanin and the guys inside to run out to the corners so they knew they were setting up play waiting for the run and then the ball was being um, given into the corners where Tip done it the last day now I don't have me facts I don't have me figures exactly but I haven't fairly right is that the turnovers that the tip forwards got the last day, so if it was the John McGrath, Jason Ford, Shamie Cannon, the turnovers they got the last day in around the Limerick half back line cut out that supply given into the Limerick forwards line. But the work rate then, when the turnovers, when the turnovers from Shamie Cannon bubbles and just say John McGrath, when them turnovers came, it was extra scores for tip. Their work rate I've never seen the tip really work with and cutting out that supply into the Limerick um, forwards. And I think that's going to be a key, key battle this week is that the likes of Shamie Callan are setting a standard. Right down as far as my first memory this year was running 80 yards for the hook on the Watford goalie out on the sideline. That just set a standard and said, right, so if he's prepared to do this, the rest of the guys will be prepared to do this. And you're going to have the likes of a Parik Mar sitting back because he knows his forwards are working hard. So he'll sit back and he'll mind James Barry. Now, that's fine. But if you want to have a shootout with Shamie Callanan and Bubbles and John McGrath and Noel McGrath, a shootout of pints, it's going to be, I, I, I'm going to back my own lads here mm. that they're going to win this one because the boys are going to protect the D, protect the square. But don't, if you give our guys room, these, these guys are on the, the confidence are huge. Uh, they're after winning their games, but they know their work rate is up and they're actually playing for each other as a unit. But if you want to shoot out again, tip, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> bring it on, is it? Let's just cut that there. <laughs> Porik Maher, let's talk about him because we're always raving about him and we're talking about what a great sort of uh, role he's doing for Tipperary. But I want to see how Limerick can get at him. So we'll pull out the tactics board and have a look at that. Yeah, we're just looking at the possibility of what John Coyley may have learned, if you like. What, what happened and was very evident the last day, I suppose, was that Porik Maher basically located himself, as Lars said, at the edge of the D for the whole game. The reason he did this, I suppose, is that Kyle Hayes was very deep, out right out here in the middle of the field. And he became the property of either Noel McGrath or Mikey Breen or Bubbles from Centre Ford or Jake Morris or Bonner. And Tipperary had a half four and right out in the middle of the field like that. So what I could envisage happening, if Gerard Hegarty is restored to number 10 and if Tom Morrissey is restored to number 12 and if they go with Kyle Hayes again here at Centre Ford, you may see a situation where Kyle Hayes comes right in on Porrig Maher. Almost not marking him, but in, a, in an area where he's able to say to himself, you know, I'm right up on Porrig Maher. If I win a ball here, there's only Porrig Maher and James Barry between me and the goal. And it, for, for that to happen and Limerick to play their normal game, what they would need is they'd need either a Peter Casey or a Graham Mulcahy, which they've often done, to supplement the middle of the field. OK, and you saw the last time, even from the clip there, that Sean O'Brien came with Graham Mulcahy. This, in turn, then, allows the middle of the field to be a complete war zone. You have Dermot Burns, who normally hangs back at right half-back, and Declan Hannon will be restored to centre-back, and he'll hang back here. And the only danger there is the point that Lar made in terms of you have the Tipperary bodies out here, and they have bubbles, you have Shamie Callan possibly coming out, and they can hurt you. But the one thing that, that Limerick may focus on is stopping Paul Igmar. You know, getting hooks and blocks on Paul Igmar, and in putting Hayes or indeed Hegarty in a situation where they're right up on Porig Mar and they're in a situation where they can hurt them as opposed to the last day which is they were fairly conventional if you like not more conventional than Limerick normally Kyle Hayes is out here getting on an amount of ball but Porig Mar is just sweeping back in front of Galan and Kyle Barrett he's getting on the second ball here and he's setting up play so I think a lot of the focus if you're if you're playing against Tipperary a lot of the focus has to be on stopping Porig Mar a couple of years ago, we would have played Tyg in a similar situation to De Declan Hannon there, and we would have instruction for the guys to get to Porig Mar. Easier said than done. Porig Mar was able to read it, was able to free himself up, and Porig Mar was able to dominate from back here. It goes back to the, the whole scenario with Porig Welch and Kevin Foley that Lar <coughs> talked about earlier on. But that's what could happen, and that's where, where I think they'll get the best joy out of, Por out of Porig Mar. Because you have to remember, if, if Brendan Mar is picking up the road, Hegarty, he could be gone 100 yards from the goal, and Kyle Hayes could be in a situation where he has acres of space to run into on Porig Mar as well. 
It's fascinating, and obviously that's one key area for Tipperary and Limerick to both look at. The key matchup that he's have picked out though for this game is Mikey Breen against Keane Lynch. Yeah, we well, we finding it hard. Last time we, we picked a matchup between Carl Barrett and Aaron Galan and it materialised. Um, thank God you know, we're following up on Lars, <laughs> Lars' prophecies there for the Wexford game. But yeah, we think Keane Lynch will be back in the Limerick team, and I think everyone thinks Keane Lynch will be back in the Limerick team. In my own head, I was kind of saying there's a possibility he could go to 11 at any stage, but you know, he'll be midfield. And, and in my opinion, Noel McGrath does the hurling for Tipperary in the middle of the field, and Keane Lynch does the hurling for Limerick in the middle of the field. And that's not saying Darrow Donovan and Mikey Breen. Mikey Breen got six points to play against, <laughs> against Waterford. But I think Breen will, will focus in on stopping Lynch as much as getting on ball himself. And that's, I think it's a, it's a key matchup. You know, if you stop Lynch at source, if he's humming, and he's and he's you know he's pulling the strings. Limerick normally play really well, you know, and and he should be really really fresh as well. So it'll be an interesting matchup. Yeah. Laura, you've uh, made a couple of big calls today. You got a couple of ones right two weeks ago. Let's yeah. put it all on the line now. Who's going well, to win this match? I'm going to wait for um, next week's episode to tell you <laughs> how Limerick, what Limerick should have done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to back my own lads. I'm not going to give away any information. <laughs> Do you want to call? Do you want to be a bit more bold? Yeah, I think look, Limerick to win the second part of what I predict to be a trilogy a three power trilogy yeah, yeah so I think Limerick will win um, home venue I think they're disappointed in the, the whole approach the last day mm. I think they'll ride a fight out and um, Limerick and Wexford for a double in my opinion yeah. and just on that as well at home in just say in, in, in tip people are worried about Limerick people are saying yeah um, Limerick could win this Limerick might that is the best thing to ground players at home when they know there's a dog fight coming Tipperary people, myself included, sometimes we kind of jump the gun a small bit if there's, this, if there's an out lift. We kind of say, yeah, we are, we're, we're ready and we mightn't be. I'm delighted at home that we're actually taking Limerick serious. People at home think that Limerick are going to win this. That is the best way to tune in players going into a Munster final because you, you can't get caught, you can't get complacent because the people around you um, on a regular basis at home are saying, watch out. Laura, you said that if Wexford can keep TJ Reid to under three scores that they'll win? Fact. You think that will happen though? Uh, looking at the game, uh, after I'd love, to, I, I'd love to be at the game mm. and I'd love to see in the, after five minutes, what has TJ done different than two weeks ago? He, so for instance, the, the two weeks ago, Wexford asked the question. So they man marked him, they asked the question. TJ has to come back now this week and answer a question. The question was asked two weeks ago. He can't come back with the same tactic. Brian Cody can't go back with the same tactic. Ask a question. After five minutes, we'll know what type of a question was asked, mm -hmm. and then we'll see then, is this question counteracted? Yeah. Wexford or Kilkenny, oh, or Wexford or Kilkenny. How can you set it up better than that? <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> so I'm going to go Wexford, and I'm going to go to TJ is going to score less than three points from Perfect. play. Lads. Super stuff, thanks yeah, very thanks much. So and thanks for joining us. If you have any questions for the lads, <laughs> leave us a comment on YouTube or get involved on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter with hashtag Corbett, hashtag McGrath. And thanks to our sponsors, Centra. See you then.